Oh, hear me okay? Cool. Um, all right, hi, welcome. I'm uh, Luke Wilson. Um, I'm a senior sound designer at Sumo Sheffield, and um, I'm going to be talking to you about accessibility and um, how we can make accessible games using audio. So, just to go straight into it, um, with a few stats, just to get you excited early on. Um, if anyone saw Joe's talk yesterday, you probably already heard some of this, so bear with me. Um, so there's a PopCap survey a few years ago um, found that 20.5% of their players identified as disabled. So that's about one in five of their players. Uh, worldwide, Xbox puts that at around 400 million disabled gamers. Um, and a separate survey by Bplayer1 found that of those disabled gamers, 91% of them found some kind of barrier to gaming um, because of their disability, whether that being a minor barrier or being completely unable to play a game because of it. So uh, yeah, 91. if we apply that to the Xbox figure, 91% of 400 million is anyone? No? Um, I don't know either. It's a lot, it's too many. Um, so essentially, as an industry, we are failing disabled players, and we need to do something about it. And the thing to do about that is accessibility. Um, so what is that? It's designing our games in a way that allows players, all players to enjoy them, regardless of any disability or environmental factors. Um, so I might be talking about audio today, but that doesn't mean we're only talking about uh, blind accessibility or deaf accessibility. It extends to uh, people with ADHD or autism, learning disabilities. And um, we have a knock-on effect of then helping people that just don't have ideal environmental situations. So they might just have a small TV, uh, bad speakers, be playing in a noisy environment with young children sleeping nearby, something like that. Um, so the idea is that we're leveling the playing field for our players. We're not just adding an easy mode. Um, we're not just adding something that makes the game more playable for everyone, like a, just a sort of adding cheats into the game, which some people seem to think it is. Um, it's making sure that when you get two people who sit down at your game, they are both playing from the same starting point. They are both at the same level when they first pick up your game. So why should we improve it? Well, we've just seen those figures, and we want to make our games accessible to as many people as possible, and we're not doing that right now as an industry. Um, and we want to create an inclusive space for all of our players. So by showing that we care about accessibility, also telling our players that we expect them to care about accessibility as well, and we want people who buy our games to know they can come to us and know that our games will be accessible. Um, and it's just the fact that it is now just an expectation. Accessibility has loads of mainstream attention right now. Um, it's not just something that you can tack on your game at the end and people will be happy with it. It might have been a few years ago that you would play a game and you would see, oh, it's got accessibility settings, that great, that's great. Um, whereas now it's, if I play a game that doesn't have accessibility options, I think, why have they not done this? This is like they've made an active choice not to do this. So in terms of audio accessibility, where do we start? Well, we start with great audio design. So audio design is your first accessibility feature, essentially. Um, so if you've got your gameplay events being clearly communicated by sound effects, so if I can hear just from a sound effect whether I'm being damaged or whether I'm damaging my opponent or if they've blocked my attack or if I've, it's missed, the sound effect alone communicates that information. We've already got an infinitely more accessible game than if it wasn't the case. And if we back that up with haptic feedback as well, then we've got two channels of really useful communication. Um, likewise with music, more generally with music, we can um, communicate gameplay states. So whether we're in stealth, uh, whether we're in combat, whether there's enemies nearby, if I'm nearing the end of a fight, that kind of thing, having adaptive music that does that for us. Um, Defining locations using ambiences. I've seen quite a few um, streams where blind players have been playing a game, they got lost in a map, um, but they go, oh wait, I know, I recognize this ambience, I've been here before, so I know I need to go back this way because I know I've been here. Um, placing your sounds in the world, so uh, using things like attenuation, spatialization, reverb, occlusion, obstruction, knowing that a weapon, if somebody has fired a weapon in the distance and I'm out in a field, if I can hear that that sound has come from inside a building because of the reverb and the occlusion and the attenuation, I know it's far away, I don't need to worry about it, as opposed to somebody firing it here, I need to know the difference. And finally, just a clear mix. So um, all of those things in that list, making sure that the most important of them at any one time is standing out in the mix. So if my mate has just bought a brand new remote and is spamming it repeatedly next to me, do I care about that or do I care about 
a grenade that's just landed two feet in front of me. So you've made a great sounding game, you've got great music, you've got sound design, but your perfectly crafted mix is not going to be for everyone. There is a variety of reasons, disabilities, environmental factors, why your mix does not work for every player. So we need to provide some options to allow them to tweak that. Uh, start with the most basic volume sliders. This is like just a must have at your bare minimum audio setting is a volume slider. So we, um, at a minimum, we want master sound effects, voice, music, those four main categories. But we can open those up and go a bit deeper. So people who experience things like sensory overload might not want a full ambience. They just want to hear the gameplay essential sounds. So we give the option to pull that down. Splitting out diegetic music, so music that comes from a sound source in the game, like a car or a gig, something like that, as opposed to the non-diegetic score. Um, separating a player VO to, with NPC VO, so um, like essential story VO versus incidental stuff that's just passing by you and it's just filling up the ambience, really. Um, and UI and HUD sounds, it's just anything that is further cluttering up your mix that any player might want to remove. But then we can go game specific as well. So if you've got a commentator or a narrator, having an option for that. Tinnitus sound, in this context, I mean when people are actually adding tinnitus sounds into a game, so like an explosion goes off and you hear a ringing. Uh, just don't do that. That's the best way to get around it, is don't do it. Um, but if you absolutely insist on doing it, then please put a volume slider in, because most people don't really want it. It's just not a good idea. Um, persistent loud sounds, weapons, vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, Licensed music, streamers aren't going to want licensed music while they're streaming, so the option to get rid of that. Uh, every other accessibility feature that I talk about today that in any way adds more audio to your mix, adding a volume slider in that menu to be able to pull that down. And also uh, an optional cutscene toggle. So it depends how you've implemented your cutscene audio in the first place, but um, some players might um, not want to have, they might want to craft a perfect mix for gameplay, but then when a cinematic triggers, they just want to sit back and experience it as it was intended. So having a cutscene toggle that just disables these volume sliders as soon as you get into a cutscene is a great help for those players. Content frequency is kind of the same idea. We're reducing how much sound is in the mix, but we're not doing it by pulling down the volume. We're reducing how much it triggers in the first place. So stuff like music, we can choose what kind of music we want, whether we want it in combat, whether we want it just while we're exploring, we just want some uh, ambient music while we're exploring. Um, and we could reduce how often that happens. Like we might just have some ambient stings that play every so often. We could reduce the frequency of them. Um, and then for VO, we can have, like I mentioned before, just story VO. Um, we can get rid of incidental VO, like NPCs wandering around. Um, puzzle hint VO frequency, so how frequently an NPC tells you how to complete a puzzle. That's a very contentious topic in a lot of games. So having an option to tweak that. Uh, listen environment. I've put here that this is about speaker setup and environment, but it also extends to a lot of disabilities. So um, this is creating an ideal mix for your specific speaker setup or environment. Um, so the first of these is dynamic range settings. So um, the difference between the loudest sounds in your game and the quietest sounds. We can change that using compression, or we can just do it manually with RTPCs boosting the quiet sounds bringing down the loud sounds. EQ, um, being able to roll off the low end, being able to filter out any frequencies that you might be sensitive to or frequencies that you're not able to hear as well. And speaker output, mono mix, absolutely essential for people with asymmetric hearing. If um, your mix skews to the left and their hearing is also stronger on the left, your mix is getting way skewed to the left then. So having an option for a mono mix is essential for those players. Um, and then we just expand it to, you know, 3D audio, HRTF, um, the number of channels of audio that you're outputting, stereo, 5 one, et cetera. Um, but we don't want to present this stuff as finicky audio things that people have to tweak. We don't want to give them a compressor. We don't want to have to have our players learning how to tweak an EQ. So the best thing is to just give them presets that do this for them. So a night mode will roll off the low end, reduce the dynamic range. Uh, we can have an instant boost high frequencies, boost low frequencies, or cut them. Um, we could do like a tinnitus preset as well for that. Um, specific mixes or processing for speaker setups. So I think the Wise Mastering Suite does this like to a certain level already, where it does like multiband compression for soundbars, headphones, home cinema, TV speakers, that kind of thing. Um, so just allowing people to choose that for their specific speaker setup. And there's um, 
I've seen it named Focus Mix, but it might be named other things in other games. Um, but I saw this in Guardians of the Galaxy, I think it was, where what we were talking about before with the volume sliders, rather than having players have to manually tweak when they want to reduce the background sounds, this just does it for them with one button. So you'll press this, it will boost the gameplay sounds, and it will pull down the ambient sounds. So yeah, you've got great sounding game, you've got a bunch of settings so that people can tweak it to what they need, but then how do we actually make it super accessible? What like, actual features can we layer on top of what is already there? So first one I've got here is text to speech, which sounds like this. Generates voiceover based on menu, chat, or unspoken dialogue text. Also works if you're giving them SDC speech with a hangover and you just want something to do it for you. Um, but yeah, this is basically any sort of text that isn't a subtitle. So we've got uh, menu text, any mission objectives, uh, if you've got gibberish dialogue, uh, having a synthesized voiceover that just reads that stuff out for people. Uh, we want speeds for we want settings for speed, volume, voice type. If you've ever watched a blind player that uses this, actually playing the game, um, they have it set to absolutely insane speeds because they just they're so used to using it and they just want that information in and out, gone out of the way. So having those settings is essential for them. Uh, Last of Us does this really well, and they render it offline just based off text strings in the game. Um, you could just use a dialogue engine that does this at runtime, but then you've obviously got the processing um, power of that. Um, and doing this offline means you can spend some time really QAing it and making sure that everything is tweaked to perfection. Um, that being said, do check existing screen readers with your game. So if someone's playing on PC, they likely already have a screen reader that they like to use. Check your compatibility with those screen readers. Um, I don't think Xbox or PlayStation let you actually use their console screen readers in your game yet, but that might be a thing that comes soon, so it's worth checking out. Audio description, this is quite new. Um, I've only seen this done in God of War, but they do it in cinematics. Um, so this is when an event happens on screen. We have a voiceover that actually describes what is happening for anyone with visual impairments. Um, so yeah, God of War is only doing it in cinematics. Obviously, it's very difficult to do with dynamic gameplay, but we can extend it. We can do it well for scripted gameplay events or any sort of GPS tech when we need to tell the player which direction to go. Um, it, and it might be new to games, but it's not new to film, TV. They've been doing this for years. There are companies that specialize in this. Um, so work with those people. It's not like text-to-speech where we're just automatically generating something based off what we've got in game already. It needs a team to sit down and look at a cutscene and say, OK, these are the events that we care about. This is how we can space the voiceover out between the dialogue. Um, and they'll have the contacts and the knowledge of how to do that properly, so make use of them. Uh, navigation aids. Uh, so this is just for anyone with any kind of visual impairment where they need help navigating your world. Uh, the most basic of these is an audio beacon. I'll talk about audio cues more in a minute in more detail, but the most simple of these is an audio beacon. I want to get to an objective in the world. I press a button. I hear a 3D audio ping in the world. I go, OK, I need to go that direction. Um, but we can also do this with things that we already have in the world, so traversal sounds, footsteps, vehicle engines, that kind of thing. If we've got an objective we need to get to, we can manipulate the panning, the, um, the volume, um, sometimes maybe even the pitch, um, depending if you're facing the direction of your objective or not. So if I, my objective's over here, I get full footsteps, but if I start wandering off this way, we pull our footsteps down. Um, likewise, we can do that with background sounds as well. So basically treat your objective like a listener cone. So if my objective is here, this is my cone. Um, as I rotate this way, then I start to filter out ambiences and music, and I know that I'm not going the right way because I can't hear those anymore. So yeah, uh, a bit more detail on audio cues. Um, I want to go into this a bit more because it's probably the best audio accessibility feature you can do. Sony are absolutely nailing this right now. Um, Last of Us 2 was the first one they did. God of War has carried it on. Um, I'm really hoping that at some point we get some kind of standardized sound library that everyone can use to do this. Um, but for now, we're all winging it on our own. Um, so these are just additional sound effects that you can um, enable individually um, to tell you where things are in the world. So we want to use like an informative UI style sound design for this. This is like a non-diegetic thing. You can match the tone to your game world, but we don't want it to sit in your game world. It needs to sit above it and really locate things in the world for people. 
So the way to do it is to just have a glossary in your game that allows your players to individually enable, disable every single one of these sounds in the game. Um, and we also want them to be able to learn these sounds out of context. It's no use a player going into the game and having every single audio cue active and somehow having to learn what each one means. We want them to be able to go into a glossary, hear what these things sound like, learn them, and then go in the game with the ones that they need. Uh, so yeah, just um, a quick intro on how to make these. I haven't done this for a game, so this is entirely based on research. Um, interactions are your most simple. Uh, so this is your walking along, uh, there's an interactable nearby, a button prompt comes up. I can't see the button prompt, so I need an audio cue to tell me it's there. Um, we just want a short, clean 3D sound, so um, if there's a door over here, I hear a short 3D sound like this, and that tells me that there is an interactable there. And there should be one of those sounds for every interactable button, so if you have, uh, if you're on PlayStation for example, you have one for X, one for square, one for triangle, one for circle. And um, that tells us what button we need. Once we've learned that, we know what button we need to press immediately. And then we can identify the object if we want to after that as well. So we can have like a, a key and a door sound so we know that it's a door. But we can also manipulate that sound itself to give us more information from it. So if that's your normal uh, audio cue for say pressing triangle, um, what if there's an interaction that's a bit too far away? I need to know about it, I need to know it's there, but I can't interact with it because I'm too far away. So that way we just add a slightly slower attack to it and just filter it a bit, so it's more like this. So it's more of a smooth fade in, and that conveys that distance to it. And then once we get closer, we'll get the full um, audio ping. Um, and there's also button holds as well. So we don't just want to make the original sound longer for this, because then the player has to sit and wait and go, I think that was longer, and they're probably going to wait longer than they need to do to establish that that sound is definitely longer, and then they're going to hold the button down which in fast place gameplay is useless to people. So we just want a really fast, short delay like this. And as soon as I hear that first delay, I know, right, I need to press and hold that button now. Uh, navigation and aiming, I already talked about an audio beacon. That's the most basic, just a 3D sound in the world that tells you where your objective is. Um, but again, we can manipulate this and we can use pitch um, to represent height and distance. Um, and we can also use this for aiming as well. So Last of Us 2 does this really well. When you target an enemy, you hear the uh, audio cue that you've targeted an enemy, and the pitch of that sound tells you where on the enemy you've targeted them. Um, same in Street Fighter VI. Uh, their audio cue system is layered beneath the actual main gameplay sounds. Um, so when you hit an opponent, the pitch of that sound tells you where you've hit them. So <clears throat> if I was to do uh, a low kick, it'd be like this. <laughs> or a mid kick. <laughs> and in the face, like this, like, like that, but with actual good sound design by talented people. Um, so yeah, um, just some general tips about how to approach it. Uh, using consistent sound effects choices. This is about information and learning. we need players to learn these sounds. So we don't want variety. We don't want like you would have 40 idle vocalizations for an enemy. We just want one enemy sound telling me that's an enemy. Okay, I know about that. I know what I need to do now. Obviously, spatialize where possible. 3D navigation falls apart if your sound isn't in 3D. Emphasize it with haptics. Um, you might have to do some sort of priority system so that your accessibility haptics override your main game haptics, because otherwise you're just going to get a constantly vibrating controller. Um, but again, that's another channel of information that's helping people out. And just follow core sound design principles that people have learned through decades of gaming. Um, engaging with something versus disengaging success and fail, how that relates to uh, like perfect musical intervals or noise versus tonal and that kind of thing. So just following the principles that everyone has learned from gaming for years. So yeah, so that's your audio features. So now your game is completely audio accessible. It's great, you've done a great job. Um, but what about deaf players or people who are playing in an environment where they can't hear the audio? That doesn't make audio irrelevant. We're still conveying key information through audio and we can't just remove that channel completely and just go, oh well, people are just gonna have to deal with it. Um, so we want some visual features that can represent that. So obviously most basic, again, subtitles, any sort of dialogue needs a subtitle. Have these enabled by default. Most people leave them on. There's no point having them disabled by default. So enable them. Um, but again, that's just the most basic level is just having the dialogue there. 
Um, we want to actually convey the emotional performance of the line, so put some descriptions in, treat it like a, a script, and say what the character is feeling and how they're performing that line. Um, and identify where they are in the world as well, if a character is off screen. Um, if I can't see that character and I can't hear that they're down in a cave over here, I can't hear the reverb and the attenuation on their voice, I'm just going to see a subtitle and think, right, where's that coming from? Who's this? So identifying who they are and where they are is super useful. Captions are basically an extension of subtitles. So subtitles are for music, uh, subtitles for dialogue. Captions are for music and sound effects. So most simple level, we can just tie into the music state system. And whenever combat music starts, we just tell the player that combat music has started. Um, or we can go more detailed and we can t attach actual descriptions to our music and our, the layers of our music. So we can say literally what the drums are doing or that the strings have just come in, that kind of thing, and give people a real idea of what the music is doing. Um, or we can just go literal and if there's a licensed track in your game, just put the name of that track and who performed it. Um, sound effects, we want to be much more concise. Uh, just a very simple description of what is happening there with the key information. If an enemy is walking over here and there's an enemy footstep sound, I just want the, cap the caption to say enemy footsteps. We don't need it to say enemy footstep wearing up boots in the snow. It's irrelevant. We just need to know there's an enemy there. Um, so we want to identify where they are as well. Um, so their world position. So we can use arrows, like if you can see this GIF uh, from God of War. It's like a dynamic arrow that moves based on the position of the sound source. Um, and we can also uh, move the caption itself left and right on the screen. So if you've got like multiple captions at once, position them across the screen based on where they are in the world. Um, obviously, this is going to need a priority system. We don't want, if there's 150 sounds going off at once, we don't want 150 captions because you're just not even going to see your game. Um, so, we don't need to start this from scratch. Your audio team are already making audio culling systems. They're already culling emitters that aren't heard. They're already prioritizing things in the mix that matter the most in gameplay. Um, so speak to your audio team and get that data from them. Use it. Um, not just because it's easier. You'll save yourself a lot of time already having that information ready, but also then there's consistency between what you're actually hearing and what the caption is doing. You're conveying the intention of the audio team in your captions that way. Audio Compass, uh, most well known from Fortnite. This is basically just a more visual version of uh, captions. Uh, so we just show a, we show a radi radius around the player, and we have a posi positional icon um, that shows where a sound is coming from in the world. So you can see this Fortnite one. There's an orange uh, thing with an icon for gunfire, and then a white one with a feet icon for footsteps. And uh, we want to go even more general with this. We just want sound categories. We don't need types of enemy or any of that kind of thing. We just want it to be like guns, footsteps, vehicles, something is over here. So it can be quite general with this. And we can use like opacity and color to represent the distance from the sound source. Um, so you can do that just grabbing the distance to it in game, or you can literally pull from your audio data and try and get like a really tight sync. So when a gun goes pop, pop, pop over here, I see a visual pop, pop, pop on my screen. And I can really relate the two then. Uh, again, use existing audio data. Um, it's the same thing. We've already got these. We're all, we don't want every single sound in the game appearing on this radius. So we want to kill anything that's irrelevant to us. So use the audio data that is already there. Ping systems. Uh, this was most well known from Apex Legends. So this is where a co-op partner can ping something in the world. And you'll get this is an audio and visual feature, really. Um, you'll get a visual icon, a UI icon appears in the screen. You'll get a sound effect that identifies it, and maybe you'll even get some VO as well. So ideally, you've got all three of them. So you've got three channels of communication, and it's really clear to anybody. Um, we want to treat these sounds the same way we treat audio cues. So you're giving them a clear identifying sound effect. We don't want variation. We just want this person has tagged an enemy. So I'm playing the enemy tagged sound. That's it. Like I said, support with VO where possible get as many channels in there as you can. And I always see these things discussed in um, like the context of multiplayer shooters, same with the audio compass, really. But this stuff is useful in any co-op game, you can imagine. We could have put something like this in Sackboy, and it would have instantly get, made that game more accessible. If you could run around, if I could say a visually impaired player could run around with a, 
another player who could ping things out for them and say like there's a collectible over here you can pick up or there's something you can jump over there's an enemy here putting a ping system in any co-op game is super useful for people and another like audio description this is quite new um, I only discovered this was happening while I was writing this presentation um, but Forza Horizon does this they have sign language videos on their cinematics um, again it's about going beyond a functional level of accessibility it, a subtitle is just functional. People who sign, it's their method of communication. It's how they experience communication in the real world. So we want to reflect that in our games. Obviously, doing this for every dialogue line, having videos, and that is going to be quite a lot of work. Um, but hopefully at some point we can get to that. But as a bare minimum now, we can be doing this on cinematics. Uh, one thing I only learned recently was that these need localizing more than VO. So that's something to note. Um, just because someone uses the same written language doesn't mean they use the same sign language. So people who write English or read English, um, they will, might sign in British sign language and they might sign in American sign language or Australian. There's a lot of varieties of it, so something to take into account. So use specialist companies and advisors. It's not new to TV, it's not new to film. This stuff has been going for years. Games is just catching up. Um, so use the companies that specialise in this. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to get into a new industry and help people uh, who use sign language. So yeah, that's all our features. That's our checklist of features to go through. Um, but how do we actually get there? What can we do as a team to actually get to this point? The most essential one is collaborate. Ideally, I'd say have accessibility feature owners in every discipline on your project. So it doesn't mean you have to do all the work. But having somebody within every team on your project who meets weekly or bi-weekly or whatever has oversight of what your team is doing accessibility-wise and can discuss that with what other teams are doing, you're automatically going to have a more accessible game by doing that. Likewise, designing with your accessibility in mind, we're not just adding on accessibility at the end. Um, whether you're designing a sound effect, whether you're designing the mission, um, you want to be taking accessibility into account. So have I made this sound as clear and accessible as possible? Am I communicating what I want to do with this sound? Then, after you've finished that, then you can say, okay, now what settings can I add on top of this and make it super accessible? And like I was saying with collaborating with other disciplines, use that to combine your features into presets. Um, so it might be that the audio team are doing something for blind people, that the FX team are doing something um, all these different teams making accessibility features for blind people and they all go in the game separately and then that player has to go into the game, find out what they can and can't do, then go into the settings menu and tweak it. Whereas if we combine this into a preset, present it to them on boot, they've got that information straight away and they can just tweak what tiny details they need to change after that. Uh, like I've been saying throughout as many channels as possible, whenever there's an essential gameplay moment, so if there's a big explosion on screen, makes all this visual feedback, audio feedback, haptic feedback, everything that a player needs to respond to, have as many channels as possible communicating that. And this one I cannot emphasize enough is play test. Do not just make all these features and then ship your game and go, yeah, we've done a great job because then somebody can play it and go like, yeah, you've not thought about this and all the things you spent three years working on are irrelevant because that player can't get past level one. So use accessibility advisors, they're working in the industry, they understand the industry, <coughs> contract them, get them involved, run play tests with the disabled players throughout your development, not just at the end, and work closely with your QA team. Like if there's a progression blocker that affects everybody, there's equally a progression blocker that affects a certain percentage of your players because of accessibility. So make sure that your QA are thoroughly testing these features. So that's what we can do as a team. Um, I actually forgot to add one on that I thought about after, which is do not just use this presentation as like a checklist for accessibility. Innovate as well. The third category should be innovate, create new ideas, approach accessibility as you would any game mechanic or your audio systems, anything like that. Make sure that you are creating something new and pushing this thing forward. Like, Do we just want to follow what people are doing already or do we actually want to do something original and really lead on this? So studios, what can we do? Don't let work go to waste. Um, I don't think anybody in this room has watched this talk and gone, yeah, I'm going to put every single one of these features in my next game that comes out in January. Absolutely no problem. Um, 
this is going to be a work in progress. This is going to happen over several projects and with things like Arrowhead and any other internal software engines, we need to maintain any progress that we make on this and take it forward across our projects. Um, and just like I said, having accessibility feature owners on a project, having accessibility champions in every discipline across your studio and across Sumo as a whole, um, having people that meet regularly and discuss what is happening across projects. Develop relationships with external accessibility partners, so that's accessibility advisors, disabled playtesters, audio description companies, sign language companies, having those contacts ready to go so that we don't get to the point in development where we need them and then we have to go and find them. Establishing those relationships and having them ready for when we need them is going to be vital. And extending our accessibility support to marketing materials. So if you've got an accessible game, make accessible marketing. People need to know that your game is accessible. There's no point making it if people aren't going to find out about it. So if you've got audio description in your game, um, have an audio described trailer on YouTube. If you've got subtitles in your game, make sure you've got subtitles in your trailers. Um, and that extends to social media posts, accessibility portals, listing all the features that you have in your game on a website, accessibility tags in stores, so when people find your game, if they just stumble across it, they know if they can play it or not. And uh, yeah, that is what we can do as a studio. Um, there's a few resources up there, just um, some guidelines, uh, accessibility reviews, streamers, conferences, um, and a few accessibility portals that already exist. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that up while we take any questions. Thank you. Sheffield. Um, so, love the talk, big proponent of stuff. But one of the things you mentioned was around uh, sound asset variance and good core principle uh, sound design uh, would be to keep it concise for uh, kind of legibility. Is that something that's best done as a blanket rule, or is that something where you have an accessibility option where you can tick a box and all your variants are stamped down to one per idea? I mean, yeah, it's an option. You could do that. Um, I think if someone is reliant on audio cues, they're, they're going to want to be able to learn it straight away and um, just be able to get straight in the game. So if you've got a lot of variations, that it might make it more difficult for them to learn it in the first place. Um, it might be that they, they learn it, you stamp it down to one variation at the start of the game, and as they get used to it, we can increase that. But I don't think it's essential for them. I think that they they're really going to want to learn those sounds and remember it. All right, thank you. Does that answer that? <laughs> uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Okay. So for the audio accessibility features, you have like a, a long list of features. So if you have like a limited scope or budget, what would you say be like the most essential of those features? It's tough. Um, I'd like, say like, I, I mean like the first first part, like the audio stuff, not like the, uh, for the, the, deaf, play, for the de deaf players, but like audio. The audio setting stuff, yeah. 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 Um, I would say that the stuff that we are, like, we're already kind of doing, that um, they are the, they're being done because they're the most important. So things like just having your basic volume sliders, just having yeah, but outside of that, like, what, uh, what would what would I do to cover like I don't know, eighty percent of the audience, and and if I have like a limited scope, what I can do? Uh, I'd have to flip back through my own talk to remember what I talked about. <laughs> but, um, I still think that the, it's basically I've gone from the most basic um, cover all to the most advanced, like things like sign language and. Um, audio description, you're reaching less players with that. They're the more advanced features that are kind of new to us, but um, each section is kind of like, I'm going from things like text-to-speech are super useful. Um, things like subtitles, those are the kind of the easy wins, like navigating menus, anything that helps people just generally navigate your world. Um, those are gonna have a wider reach than any of the, like, I talked a lot about the stuff that is kind of like we're, we want to convey the emotional performance of things and that kind of stuff. That's less essential than stuff that makes our game playable. Um, so yeah, focusing on navigation, 
getting your conveying your story um, and essential gameplay data. That is, those are your priorities. So, does that answer that? <laughs> Cheers, Luke. Um, Ian, I'm an audio person at SEMA Sheffield. Um, what, what was I going to say? A couple of quick questions that are related to each other. So, one, in terms of like, I think you were touching on it, but in terms of like QAing this stuff, has uh, like a third party QA developers, are they sort of bringing this up, bringing that facility in, and do they have testers who disable, uh, you know, test from that disabled perspective? And the other side is just related to that as well. Um, are any of the big publishers or developers working towards guidelines and specifications for this stuff? Um, I'm not sure on the QA side, in, so, in terms of sort of outsourced QA, I was thinking more internal QA and just making sure your tools are like really rigid and that kind of thing, but I'm sure like um, if you want to reach disabled players for playtesting, there's charities like uh, Able Gamers, uh, Special Effects, places like that where they can, they've got the contacts um, and they can get people in to test your games. And likewise, accessibility advisors will always have some kind of contact with players who will be able to help you with that. Um, in terms of guidelines, um, I think they're coming. Uh, I don't know for sure. I think Joe knows more about this than I do. But <laughs> um, it's uh, what was your answer yesterday? You had this question. It was Xbox, yes. PlayStation, yes. Nintendo, no. I think that was <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but um, it, it will be like everybody, like Microsoft. Uh, at the forefront of this, and I think it definitely will become part of their compliance very soon. Um, PlayStation are following shortly behind, and I think Nintendo maybe needs to catch up, but I think they definitely will do. So, yeah. Cool, cheers, Luke. It's funny having a conversation with you over a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Max from a company called Pole Position Production. Um, great talk. Uh, I have a, if 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 there are guidelines being applied, uh, do you see there is a risk of this like the style of the game being too equal to other games and losing like some of the creative aspect that a game can have in terms of audio? Um, I don't think so. I don't think that the guidelines will go too far. I think we're at this point we're like really just pushing to have accessibility even recognized at all so i think if if there are guidelines that are going to come in i think i think we already have guidelines over subtitles um so it's going to be like the core features like the really essential things that there's going to be guidelines around some of the more creative stuff that you might be doing like audio cue systems that kind of stuff um i don't i can't see guidelines coming in for that kind of thing anytime soon so i, I don't think it would really affect any sort of creative level but yeah Hello, I'm Cardix, an occasional audio programmer at Sumo Sheffield. Uh, <laughs> um, so the uh, text to speech that's used for the, uh, the menu text and, and stuff, uh, I've seen that in quite a few games, and we always kind of seem to see robo voice. Are there any particular reasons why um, like real performances are not captured for, for that text? It seems like a, a relatively small amount of uh, lines that would need recording. It seems like it until Does you it start. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, I think it, if you're thinking about like sort of every text string in all of your menus, um, every sort of upgrade tree, every mission objective, every, if you've got any gibberish dialogue, every line of that, it's basically, it becomes a lot very quickly. Um, I think it's also just, it kind of helps. It, it might not sound great, but it helps that it, it kind of stands out separately from recorded VO, having that separate voice that sounds synthetic um if it just if it's between especially if it's between recorded dialogue lines i think it helps to be able to separate that and like what i said about speed as well if you're speeding up a recorded voice line it might just sound absolutely terrible whereas um, a synthesized voice is kind of built into the system that it can handle that thanks Um, hello, I'm Joanne. I'm not an audio person. I'm a UX designer. So um, you're talking about accessibility, which is obviously really interesting for me. Um, 
but I was looking at things like outside of disabilities, like we always think about accessibility as like, how can we help disabled people? But I'm thinking a lot recently about how we can help with like phobias, because this seems to be like a trend that's in games now where we have like arachnophobic mode. And um, I think there's like the one where you're scared of the sea. There's, I can't remember what it's called, but um, they did it in Horizon. Yes. <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> so there's a thing called misophonia, which is like fear of certain sounds. Yep. Um, and I brought it up with my audio team at Sumo Leamington, and it was it didn't really go down that well. Um, and it's not mentioned in this presentation. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, is that something that any of you audio people have come across? Um, no. Nope, and that's how can we? How can we improve it? Like, how can we consider phobias as well as, you know, just general accessibility? Like, what can we be doing to encourage, like, people that have phobias to have a better gaming experience? Yeah, it's, that's a really good point. Um, it's not in my presentation because I didn't know about it. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's definitely something that we, we could do fairly easily. Like, if you, yeah, look at, like, arachnophobia modes that already exist, they're removing um, a model of a spider or something, we could equally remove the sound of it. I was actually having this conversation with somebody the other day. I can't remember who it was. But, like, they were saying, like, the, the sound of the spider is still there, so it's still just as bad. Um, but, yeah, misophonia sounds like another great one. We could easily do that with just, like... Um, just a setting that you enable, and we have states that can disable certain sounds in the game. Um, I don't see why that's not a thing. Um, but yeah, while I've been making this presentation, like every day I go online and on Twitter, there's another new accessibility feature that I hadn't heard of. And I so like sign language. I was like, oh yeah, that's a new thing. That's another slide. Um, so yeah, this presentation could probably just go on forever as new things come up. But yeah, that's a great idea. I need to add that in. <laughs> Cheers, thank you.